Notes. We're going to be doing uh, a uh, another a part of a series that we've done in the past, and I hope that you are are ready for that. It's something that people have said they want to hear more of, so we want we're going to continue doing that. I think it's a good teaching method, and so we want you to stay tuned for that. We'll get into what it is in just a moment, but we want to give you our content information. In case you want to reach us, we hope that you will take advantage of that. A word from the Lord at gmail.com, 276-340-2653 <clears throat> is how you can reach me. And uh, we hope that you will take advantage of that. Also, I haven't been uh, saying this in the past uh, couple weeks, and I've, I've been meaning to, but free Bible correspondence course, if you would like to uh, have a free Bible correspondence course, it's a, a little track, it's a 10-part series, uh, you read a little information on it, and you answer the questions, and it's just a, basically an introduction to faith, some basic principles, uh, thought-provoking questions that, uh, that you can uh, read and study to help you uh, lay, a, lay some good groundwork for uh, studying God's Word and, and uh, uh, kind of get you going, and we hope that it will be beneficial to you. But if you would like a copy of this, you can just uh, uh, email me at workmanlord at gmail.com, uh, call me, 276 340 276-340-2653 or you can write uh, to the Church of Christ um, at 250 The Boulevard. That's where we meet. Uh, 250 The Boulevard and uh, we'll get you a copy of that. We'll grade it and send it out to you. Uh, we'll send you a copy of it uh, with a self-addressed stamped envelope. You mail that back in. We'll grade yours and mail, and mail you another one back with another uh, self-addressed stamped envelope and so you only you don't have to pay for Anything other than just uh, you just have to take your time to uh, read the read the correspondence course, read the lesson, and answer the questions, and send it back in. So, hope that you will uh, take advantage of that very thing. The lesson we're going to be doing tonight is one that uh, I said we've done in, in the past a couple months ago, and people have said we got to do more of this. Uh, they enjoyed it. It was uh, uh, I don't know. It was um, uh, interesting, I guess. Some things that uh, we had seen or we see from time to time and so people thought it was helpful and someone said you got to do it do some more of it and so if you have uh, some of these signs that we are going to be discussing take a picture of it good picture of it uh, let me know where it is send it to me let me know where it is what church it is and where it is and we'll we may do another uh, continuation of this series but we want to start off by talking about signs and wonders because the Bible talks about that and friends, I'm not going to go over all this information again because I know we did it in the last uh, lesson, but signs and wonders were given or used by the apostles, inspired writers uh, in the Old and New Testament in order to verify a message. If there was a message from God, the only way you knew it was from God is if it was accompanied by something that only God could do. And uh, that's what you see in uh, uh, Nicodemus's. Uh, visit with Christ in, in John chapter 3. In John chapter 3, the Bible says there was a man sent from God, uh, excuse me, there was a man of the Pharisees, sorry, there was a man of Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And so the very fact that, that uh, Nicodemus is looking at the things that Jesus did and saying, we know that you have to be from God because nobody can do these things except God be with him. Thus indicating that Jesus was a, at least a man sent from God, that he was a messenger from God. <clears throat> uh, he didn't even have to be the, the son of God or acknowledge to be the son of God at this point, but just noting that he was indeed someone that was sent from God because of the things that he was saying and doing. And so this is, this is what we're talking about, the signs and wonders, miracles that were, uh, that were around in the, in the Old Testament and even in the first century that were used to confirm the word, confirm the message, to verify that these things were indeed from God. And uh, that's why when you hear people talking about miracles for the day, friends, you need to remember some of these verses. In Mark chapter 16, Verses 17 through 20, this is what Jesus said. He said, These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly poison, it shall not hurt them, they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. 
Now, these are things that people today say, well, this is, we have these miracles today. Miracles are, are available today. Friends, not so. If you have a miracle today, you're able to perform a sign and wonder today, then where is the message that's accompanying them? Because that's exactly what always went together. You know, it's like, like macaroni and cheese. You know, if, if there's macaroni, you know you want to have some cheese. Well, if you've got a miracle, you got to have a message. All right? Because notice verse 19, Mark 16, verse 19. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was ascended into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached, there's the word, preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. So they were confirming or verifying the word with the signs. That was the whole purpose. Now, friends, if you believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God, you believe this is the, the uh, inspired word of God, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. If you believe that, you believe that it contains all things that pertain to life and godliness, 2 Peter 1, 3, then you don't need a miracle because, number one, we have all the word we need and number two, if there is a miracle, it's only going to confirm what's written in this book. So if you have a miracle, there has to be more message. And if you have more message, <clears throat> then you're basically saying that the Bible is not all we need. See how it works? So if you have a miracle, basically you're saying the Bible is not enough. That's, what, that's really what people who, say, who claim to have miracles, that's really what they're saying. They may not realize it, but that's the conclusion that you have to come to. If you say there's miracles today, laying on of hands, speaking in tongues, that is unknown language, unlearned languages. If you say that there's uh, gifts of healing, raising the dead, I've never seen anyone raise the dead. If you think that there's a possibility that you have the, the gift to raise the dead, I'll tell you what, let's go out to any cemetery you choose. You tell them to come up, I'll tell them to stay down, we'll see who has the most power. I can promise you they will not raise from the dead. If so, the hospitals would be emptied out. We wouldn't have to worry about Obamacare because why? Everybody would have health insurance. Just go down to the local Pentecostal church. But friends, it's not happening that way. Why? Because the signs that people claim today are not available today. They're not available because the word has been confirmed. There's no, more, there's no need for more message. Therefore, there's no need for more miracles. All right? So signs and wonders are a thing of the past, but, but, and this is where we, uh, this is kind of our springboard last time, but there are some signs and wonders that are still available today, and that is the signs that we see around town in front of all these churches, and it does make me wonder. And friends, the reason I do this is because <clears throat> it really is a good opportunity to show you how people will say and do things that they Never stop and consider, is this really part of the Bible? Is this really what, what, what the Bible says? They'll just spout off anything and they'll say, well, that, that's the Bible. I heard the preacher say it. It's not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. And it's evident by the fact that people will say things and they'll, they'll uh, accept it or they'll say it as if it's the Word of God and never stop to check out, is, is, is it really part of the Word of God? Is it really in there? And so this is what we're talking about, the signs that make, that should make us wonder. And so I want to do this, and then it gives me the opportunity to give you some information from the Bible that goes with what we're seeing. Now here's a sign from the North Spray Christian Church, uh, Disciples of Christ, Disciples of Christ over in, uh, <coughs> I guess it's uh, uh, Spray uh, area of Eden. And uh, it is a sign out, out beside their building there. They have a building there. And it says the labyrinth. It's a prayer walk. And everyone's welcome to participate. Now, you can see it behind it. I'm going to show you another picture. But it's the North Spray Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, labyrinth, a prayer, a prayer walk. And I don't really know what it is. Here's, here's another picture of it. I don't know. It's just a, uh, a circle that kind of winds around and winds around. It's really... Uh, it's really an amazement. See what I did there? It's it's a it's a labyrinth, and it's really amazing why they would even why would you even have this? All right, well, what's the purpose? Now, friends, I you know, let me just say this. I I can appreciate people wanting to pray and having a mindset of prayer. Let me just say that. 
I can appreciate that because certainly I am grateful. I, I can appreciate individuals who have a mind towards spiritual things, although most people in the religious world are not correctly thinking about things, but at least, you know, at least they are acknowledging something maybe uh, uh, greater than themselves. But here's the thing. Number one, what is a prayer labyrinth? What, what, is, what, what is this? Uh, uh, walk around the circle? What, you pray till you get to the middle and you get to sit down and rest? I, I don't know. I, I don't know anything uh, about it other than it's, I can't find it in the Bible. So I don't know what it is. And the reason I don't know what it is because I don't know where it is in the Bible. But I do know what the Bible says about prayer. And so this makes me wonder, this sign, this prayer labyrinth, it makes me wonder if maybe someone doesn't really know what the Bible teaches about prayer. Maybe I can, uh, maybe I can help them. Now, certainly prayer is to be made. Let's just say that. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. I exhort therefore that, first of all, supplications, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is a good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who have all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of truth. Now, clearly, clearly it is the case that God wants individuals who pray to remember those that are in authority. It's good and acceptable in the sight of God, okay? No, no problem with that. But here's the thing, friends. Where does a labyrinth come into a prayer? Excuse me. Where does, where does a labyrinth come into your, your prayer life or a person's prayer life? Now, I know what the Bible says about prayer, but I wonder what a labyrinth, the purpose of it is. I mean, here you are. Outside, you're in a little park, I guess, for a better word, and you're walking around in a labyrinth, a circle, and you're praying. And there's a big sign that says, this is a prayer labyrinth. Now, if I saw someone out in the park, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think, well, you know, they're out there praying. If I drive by Freedom Park or I drive by some of these parks uh, down here in Eden, uh, you know, the community center or some uh, little park. I, I, don't, I don't say, well, there's somebody out there, they, they're praying. But if they're walking around in a circle in front of a little park that says prayer walk, labyrinth, then I have a pretty good idea that, you know what, they're probably praying. Now, are you doing this to be seen of men? See, the Bible talks about praying and Individuals who pray to be seen of men. Matthew, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 5. Listen to what Jesus says. He, he starts off talking about, Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Alms are good deeds. All right? You're giving, uh, giving money or doing something for, to be seen of men. And Jesus says, Don't do that. Don't do that. Like, like the hypocrites. Then notice in verse uh, 5 he says, and when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, or in the prayer labyrinths, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have uh, their reward. But when thou prayest, now notice what Jesus says, but when thou prayest, but thou when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut the door, pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Now, Jesus is not saying that you can only pray if you go into a closet. He's contrasting the idea of praying to be seen of men with the idea of praying in such a way that you're willing to go into a closet not to be seen as someone who's trying to have praise put upon them. Now listen, we're, t we're talking about praying uh, to be seen of men. What's the attitude? What's the point? What's the purpose? If I'm walking around in a circle in a prayer labyrinth or a prayer walk, uh, it has to be some kind of, to, of, of, of public thing. But like I said, I can pray walking down the street and no one's even knowing I'm praying. I can pray everywhere. I can pray anywhere. 
Now, the Bible actually says, if we go back to 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8, listen to what Paul says. He's already talked about praying for all men. It's uh, acceptable and well-pleasing to God and so forth. Now look what he says in verse seven, verse 8. He, sa he says, I will that I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without, without wrath and doubting. The idea of, of, of lifting up holy hands is you have a pure life. Pure individuals should pray. Why? Because God is not going to hear the prayer of sinners. Those in, individuals who have sinned against them, pr sin will hinder your prayers. That's why I, uh, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 says that it's not that God's hand is too short or his ear that he can't hear, but it's just that your sins and transgressions, your iniquities have separated between you and your God that he will not hear. Now I'm paraphrasing Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, but the idea is sins are what stop God from heeding your prayers. And so Paul says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere lifting up holy hands. That is, they have to have pure life. And he says, for men to pray everywhere. Now, does that mean that you're walking down the street and you're, you're praying whatever? No, that's not what he's talking about. The idea is pray everywhere. He says, I want you to pray, be ever fervent in prayer. He's going to say, he's going to say in the letter to the Thessalonians, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> notice, notice what he says. He says, I'm in 1 Thessalonians 5 and uh, verse 17, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Now, why is he saying that? He's saying you should be in a prayerful mindset, being willing to pray always. You should never stop praying. Jesus said in Luke 18, Luke 18 in verse 1, he said, he spake, unto them, he spake a parable unto them and to this end that men ought to always pray and not to faint. In other words, don't stop praying. Don't stop, don't stop uh, asking uh, our Heavenly Father for things. But what Paul is saying when he says men pray everywhere, it's the idea of don't draw attention to yourself. Now, can I pray? If I'm in a restaurant and I'm fishing to eat, can I pray? Yes, and I do pray. But you know what I don't do? I don't kneel down by my table and I don't raise up my hands and I don't pray in a big loud voice so that everybody around me can hear me. I bow my head and I'll say a prayer and I thank God for my food. And that's what, it, that's what it's for. And most people aren't even paying attention or they don't see any, any notice anything about it because I'm not trying to draw attention to myself. Now, that's the purpose of prayer. So when I see, when I see a prayer labyrinth, I wonder, what is that for? Do they know anything about prayer? Do they realize that God is saying not to, be, not to pray to be seen of men? Now, we're not even touching the fact that prayer is a privilege for those individuals who are in the body of Christ. I had to bring this up. Someone says, well, that's not to be seen of men. Okay, let's, let's just take that. Uh, as it is, let's say it's not to be seen in the prayer walk or prayer labyrinth, whatever it is, it's not to be seen in men. Okay, if you say so, I'll give you that. But here's the thing. Do you stop and think that prayer is for those who are in Christ? That is, they're in the body of Christ. Prayer is a, is a privilege for those who are in a covenant relationship with God. And thus, those individuals, those individuals that are, that are in that covenant relationship with God, can be, uh, can be and will be heard of God, their prayers will be heard. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 12, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them to do evil. And you say, well, James, you're saying everybody in the disciples of Christ are doing evil? Well, friends, I know this. I know they haven't obeyed God because God never said be a member of the disciples of Christ. Denomination. He never said that. He never said be a part of the, of the Christian church, disciple of Christ. So I know that they not, they're not in speaking terms with God. Their prayers don't go any higher than the ceiling. 
Now you say, well, that's why we out. Maybe that's why they're walking around outside because they want their prayers to go higher than the ceiling. Well, their prayers will go up and be caught in the wind and carried off somewhere. It's not getting to heaven. It's not getting to the, to the, uh, uh, the Father's throne because they're not in speaking terms with God. Now, friends, that may make somebody mad. But there's no way you can show me in the Scripture how God is going to hear prayers of individuals who are in open rebellion to Him when, by not being in the church that His Son died for, paid for with his blood. But they say they're disciples of Christ. Well, friends, there are some other signs that will that indicate to me that, you know what, they're probably not uh, as much disciples as you think they are. Now, aside from the fact that I can't find the Christian church or the disciples of Christ in the Bible, let me give you another sign that kind of makes me wonder. Now this again, this is a sign. This is a sign that uh, that's right there at the North Spray uh, Christian Church, the Disciples of Christ. North Spray Christian Church, the Disciples of Christ. Here's this sign. Now sometimes, friends, signs aren't always what you think they are. All right? You know, signs don't have to have words on them. They just might be a, a symbol or a picture. Now, here's a sign right there at the North Spray Christian Church. Now, I'd like to wonder about this. Here's a sign. Now, that sign made me wonder. Now, if you don't know what that is, friends, that's where you'd put your cigarettes out. Right? So, before you walk into the church building, you know, you take one last long draw on that old, you know, Marlboro or whatever it is. And you put it in the, in the cigarette butt dispenser there so it doesn't litter up the parking lot. Well, that's good that they're not littering. littering. But friends, that's a sign. That's an indication. That's a marker. That tells me something. That tells me something about the North Spray Christian Church. It makes me wonder, and it makes me wonder, do the disciples of Christ who have... Discipline in their name. Disciple. That's what disciple means. It means to make it people uh, give them some discipline. A disciple is a follower. But do they teach their people to have discipline in their lives? Because when you have a cigarette butt dispenser, or not dispenser, but uh, I don't know what, receptacle, sitting on the front steps right before you walk into the church, but that, that tells me something. You can't, be, you can't be discouraging people from smoking. You can't be discouraging people from smoking because you've got, you've got the cigarette butt receptacle right there before you walk in. You're actually saying, hey, we're more concerned about littering. Throw your cigarette butt away. But the whole point is, it makes me wonder, have they even stopped to consider that the very name or the very thing they're calling themselves, they're showing that they're not doing it. In Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18, Jesus said, All power is given to me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. That word teach means to make disciples. And you make disciples by having discipline. Now, what do we mean by discipline? Friends, if you are disciplined, you have some self-control. The Bible uses the term temperance. Chapter 9, verse 24. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24. I know, uh, know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. Then now Paul, he's talking about running the Christian race. And notice the comparison. Know what he says. He says, every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. He's self-controlled in all things. Now, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainty, so fight I, not as one that be of the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest 
that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be cast away. He says, I stay in control of my body. Now, friends, are you mean to tell me that this sign, this sign at the North Spray Christian Church Disciples of Christ building, is that a sign that says discipline? Is that a sign that says we promote temperance? We promote self-control? Yeah, you got to have self-control so you don't flick that cigarette butt out there in the yard. Well, friends, that's not the kind of temperance we're talking about here. We're talking about something in control of your body. And I've known plenty of people who smoked, and, and it's an addiction. Oh, I, I, it's, it's controlling their life. Wake up in the morning, got to have a cigarette. Eat breakfast, got to have the cigarette. Eat lunch, got to have the cigarette. I don't have a cigarette after the cigarette. I used to know a man, uh, he, uh, and he had uh, he, he'd smoked a cigarette, and right before it burned down, he'd light another one with it. He'd use one to light the other, chain smoker. There he goes. He didn't have any self-control. That man was not a member of the church, by the way. Now, here's what I'm talking about. This sign tells me we're not really concerned about being disciples. We're not really concerned about being disciplined. 2 Peter 1 and verse 6. 2 Peter 1 and verse 6. Now look what Peter says. Peter says, uh, Beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance. Now, friends, I have to wonder, and I'm just wondering, I'm just wondering, is the reason why the, the, the North Spray Christian Church Disciples of Christ, is the reason why their members don't seem to have any temperance, is it because maybe they haven't added knowledge? So you have to have some knowledge to have temperance. I'm trying to give you some knowledge. The Bible says that you have to be in control. Friends, smoking, drinking, anything that's really that becomes a habit, if it's in control of you, you're not in control. And I would say the same thing about people who get up and say, well, I got to have my coffee. Friends, if you got to have it, if you got to have it, listen to what you're saying. I got to have it. You're not in control. You're not in control. So I'm trying to give you some knowledge so that you can add to that knowledge temperance. Maybe the reason why they don't have any temperance is because they haven't been given much knowledge. I'm just wondering, see. That sign makes me wonder. Makes me wonder. All right? Well, there's your sign. Here's a sign. This is the Draper Christian Church. Let's move on over to Draper. Draper Christian Church. John 14, 15. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. You know what? I like, I like to see the Bible references put up on signs. Because at least, I mean, at least the people driving by are at least getting some uh, word from the Lord. All right? That's good. It's just a little pithy little saying. You know, at least they're getting some Bible here. But here, here's what makes me wonder about this. Draper Christian Church has John 14, 15, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That, that's, now that sign, that's good. The Bible verse is good. But here's what this sign makes me do. It makes me wonder. It makes me want to do they love God. John 14, 15. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. It makes me wonder, do they know God? Now here's why I say that. Because obedience to God is certainly essential. I mean, it's necessary. All right. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9. Hebrews 5 verse 9, being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that will obey him. All right? If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That is, you will obey him. Now, so love is connected, love is connected to obeying. But notice this. 
Knowing is connected to loving. Obeying is connected to knowing. Knowing, loving, obeying, they're all connected. How do I know that? Because notice this. In 1 John 2 and verse 3, 1 John 2 and verse 3, it's easy as 1, 2, 3. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Now that's almost the same language that Jesus used in John 14, 15. Right? If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Well, John says, if you know me, you'll keep his commandments. So you can't know God if you don't keep his commandments. And if you don't keep his commandments, you don't love him. And he saith, I, he that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar. Is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Now, you know what I would say? I'd say, let's put that with John 14, 15. He that saith, I love him, and keep not his commandments, is a liar. Because if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If you know him, you keep his commandments. If you keep his commandments, then you know him. If you say you know him, you don't keep his commandments, you're a liar. And you don't love him. Now, friends, here's my point. Obeying is loving God. And obeying is also being God's friend. Look at John 15 and verse 14. John 15, verse 14. I'll admit to you, sometimes I get John 15, 14 and 14, 15 mixed up. I'll say, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, John 14, 15. And really, I mean, uh, I mean John 15, 14. And really, I mean John 14, 15. But you know what? If I get to John 15, 14, thinking it's John 14, 15, I know that all I need to do is switch them again, and I'll, and I'll find the verse I'm looking for. Because look how close they are. John 15, 14, ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments, John 14, 15. If you're my friends, you'll do whatever I command you, John 15, 14. If you know God, you'll keep his commandments, 1 John 2 and verse 3. If you don't do his commandments, if you don't keep his commandments, 1 John 2 and verse 4, you're a liar. You know what? If you say that you're God's friend and you don't keep his commandments, you're a liar. If you say, I love God, but don't keep his commandments, you're a liar. If you say, I know God, but you don't keep his commandments, you're a liar. See, knowing, loving, obeying, being God's friend, they're all connected to obedience. Now, here's what makes me wonder. When I see a sign, when I see the sign up there on the Draper uh, Christian Church that says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, I have to wonder, I have to wonder, do they really love God? Do they, or maybe I should wonder this way, maybe I should wonder, do they know that they don't really know God? Do they know that they're not really God's friends? I wonder, do they know that they don't really love God, they're not really God's friends because they're not keeping His commandments, they're not obeying Him. How do I know that? Is being in the Christian church obeying God? God never said do it. God never commanded anybody to be in the Christian church. Or the Baptist church, or the Methodist church, or the Lutheran church, or the Presbyterian church, or the Catholic church, or any other church for that matter. Denomination for that matter. He, he never said that. He never said be a part of any denomination. So it's not just the Christian church we're talking about. We can put any church there. It just so happens that the Drebber Christian church has that on their sign. So, can you say that they are obeying God? Friends, be honest with me. You telling me you obeyed God when you became a member of the Christian church? Well, where did you, where did you see that commandment? Where did you hear that commandment? I, I, I know God never told anybody to get into the Christian church. Now, I wonder, do, do you realize that you don't really know God? Because how can you know God, that is, how can you say you love him, you obeyed him, that you're his friend, if you're in a church that God never commanded you to be in? So, oh, I, I know God's on my side. Friends, if you say you know him and you don't keep his commandments, guess what? You're a liar. 
I'm trying to be nice about it, but friends, you're lying to yourself. Maybe that might ease it just a little bit, but you're lying to yourself. If you say that you know God when you're in a church that God never said anything about, you're lying to yourself if you're saying, well, I'm obeying God. When you're in a church that God never told you to get into. Do, so I wonder, do you, do you love God? If you love God, why don't you keep his commandments? And his commandments would be come out of the denomination like the Christian church or even the uh, Disciples of Christ Christian church or the Baptist church or the Methodist church or the Presbyterian church or the Lutheran church or the Apostolic church or the uh, <coughs> Church of Jesus Christ or the firstborn number seven. It's not in the Bible. See, I'm, I'm wondering, are you just fooling yourself? You think you're God's friend? Jesus said, if you're my friend, you'll keep my commandments. Now, friends, I'd give somebody $1,000 if they could show me the Christian church in the Bible. Show me where the church in the Bible, the church that Jesus died for, show me where it's called the Christian church. See? Individuals who say, well, I, you know, if you love God, keep my commandments. And then indicate that they're part of a church that God never commanded them to be a part of. He never even talked about, never thought about. Never came into his mind. You know what that tells me? They don't really know God, but you know what? Here's what I do know. I do know what Jesus is going to say about knowing them. They can claim all they want to. Well, I know God. I love God. He's my friend. I know what Jesus said about it. In Matthew 7 and verse 23. Matthew 7 and verse 23. Jesus said, Then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. For whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, we could say, loves Jesus. Because that's what he just said in John 14, 15. Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them is God's friend. Whoever heareth, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them knows him. Whosoever therefore heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, Jesus says, I will know him. It's like being built upon a rock. It's like a man building a house upon a rock. And you know the story. You know the teaching right there. The wise man builds his house upon the rock. That is by building upon what you hear God saying. Friends, dear friend, if you're in the Christian church, and I, I know there's a lot of folks, I, I know a lot of folks in the Christian church in this area. If you're in the Christian church, Friends, you're not in the church that God talked about. You're not building your church upon, you're not building your house upon a rock. But the shifting sands of false belief. Here you are saying, I know, I know, I know, I know. And God's going, I don't know. I'm just wondering. See, when I see that sign, it makes me wonder. They realize that they're telling everybody that they don't really know God because they're not keeping these commandments. That they don't love God because they're not keeping His commandments. They're not really God's friend because they're not keeping His commandments. There's some signs that make me wonder. Signs that make me wonder. Here's another one. <clears throat> Here's another one. Stanley Town United Methodist Church. This is one a little humor. You see this on a billboard time to time, something like this. It says, let's meet at my house before the game. God. And I don't know if that says dot net meal. I don't know really what that means. Dot net meal or net meal. I don't know what that means. But I know what it means to meet at the house of God, uh, God's house before the game. There's a lot of people. There's a lot of people that sit at home and watch the ball game instead of worshiping God. So that's, that's a good sentiment right there. We know God, God would say well, he wants you to meet at his house. But here's what makes me wonder. This sign makes me wonder. Does the 
Stanley Town United Methodist Church, do they know what God's house is? I mean, they're telling everybody, meet it. God says, meet at my house before the game. But do they know what God's house is? Listen, in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 14. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 14. These things write unto thee, hoping to come to thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So the house of God is the church of the living God. Now someone's going to say, all right, James, see that? There, there it is, the church of the living God. Well, for the sake of this discussion, this sign, that's not the Methodist church. That's not the Methodist church. But see what Paul is doing. He's showing that the, the church is the house of God. Now, what church is it? The church of the living God? Well, who's the living God? Well, the Father is living. But it is talking about the God who is now alive. The God that died, the part of God that died, shed his blood to purchase the church and now is living. That's Christ. The church that Jesus died for is the house of the living God. It's made up of people who have obeyed the gospel. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. 1 Peter 2 and verse 5 this is what Peter says. He says, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house. We're not talking about meaning at some building of brick and mortar and calling that the house of God or the church of God. That's not the church. The building is not the church. The, phys the, the physical building is not the church. Now, there may be a physical building where the church meets. That's what we're talking about. But the house of God, when the, when the standing town United Methodist Church says, meet, God says, meet at the house of God, they're not talking about, the, he's not talking about the Methodist Church as being the house of God. I know that because the Bible never talks about the Meth, United Methodist Church being part of the church of God. We're talking about the house of that Christ built. Hebrews 3, Hebrews 3, beginning at verse 1. Look at this. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, <clears throat> who was faithful to him that appointed him. Now he's going to compare Christ to Moses. As also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses. What man? Christ? This man was counted more, uh, worthy of more glory than Moses inasmuch as he who hath built the house hath more honor than the house. Verse 4. Every house is built by some men, man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant, for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are. Paul says, look, people are the house of God and it's Christ's own house. It's his own house. Now, have you heard that before? Have you heard that before? Look at this. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and over the flock of which the Holy Ghost has made the overseers to feed the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. Christ's own blood purchased his own house. Belonged to him. And yes, it's called the church of God. Yes, it's called the church of the living God. It's called the house of God. But ultimately it is the church of that belongs to Christ because he bought it with his, own house, with his own blood, therefore it's his own house. Matthew 16, 18, Upon this rock I will build my church. Which church is it? The church that Christ built, it belongs to him. 
Now, friends, you can say all day, well, there's the church of the living God, the house of God, the, the uh, uh, church of God. Friends, those are all talking about the church that Christ built and paid for with his own blood. It's not, it's not the Methodist church. It's not the United Methodist Church. It's not the Baptist Church, the First Baptist Church, the Second Baptist Church, Third Baptist Church, and the Presbyterian Church. It's not the Lutheran Church. It's not the Pentecostal Church. not any of these denominations. Why? God did not send His Son to die for all these man-made churches that did not exist until a thousand years later. Now, the house that we're talking about is the church. Now, I wonder if the Stanley Town United Methodist Church realizes that when they say God wants us to meet at, at his house before the game, there shouldn't be anybody at, at the Methodist Church building. There shouldn't be anybody in the Methodist Church. The church is the body of Christ. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. The church is the body, and the body is the church. Now, look at this. Ephesians 2, and verse 20. Ephesians 2 and verse 20. <clears throat> we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Friends, the apostles and prophets never talked about the Methodist church or any other denomination for that matter. So you can't, the house that God wants you to meet at cannot be in these denominations. They, were, they aren't built upon the foundation of the apostles or the prophets. And Jesus Christ is certainly not the cornerstone of any, any of these denominations. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into an holy temple in the Lord. We're talking about a spiritual building, a spiritual house. 1 Peter 2, 5, and 9. In whom also ye are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. It is the house of God. The church is the house of God. Now I wonder, I wonder, when people say God wants to meet at his house, do they stop and realize, you know what? The Methodist church is not it. You realize that you're advertising everybody should come assemble with the Lord's people who are the building who we are the spiritual building, the spiritual temple, the habitation of God. That's what we're talking about. So everybody stand in town, you know, the house of God assembles in, in your area. It, you can go right down there to 823 Starling Avenue. See that? In Danville, the house of God assembles at 120 American Legion. In Eden, the house of God assembles at 250 the Boulevard. You, you see what I'm saying? If you want to meet at God's house, you have to meet with God's house, really how it should be. Meet with God's house, the people that make up God's house. Friends, I know I'm out of time, or just about out of time, but I, I think I have time for one more. This is almost sad. This sign really makes me wonder. This is the First Baptist Church in Draper. He is not here. Now, friends, when I saw that, I thought, you know, I can't believe that. Now, I will say, I'll give full disclosure, that's, that's part of a verse. The other side of the sign said he is risen. This is an Easter sign, right? Easter marquee. But I thought, here's an interesting point. If I'm looking for Jesus and I went and knocked on the Baptist the, the building where the Baptist church assembles, and I said, I'm looking for Jesus. Well, the sign said he's not here. Don't have to look there, he's not there. You know, friends, if I go to a store, if I walk into a business, and uh, as I'm walking up to the store, I see it says closed. You know what I know? Nobody's there. I'm not going to try. I'm not going to try to find who I'm looking for. They're not there. He's not here. He's not here. Friends, if you're looking for Christ and you're looking for his church, which is his body, 
which he purchased with his own blood, which is his own house, like we just talked about in the previous sign, this sign ought to make you wonder, do they realize what they're saying? You know, I think sometimes I, I think, you know, O. Caiaphas uh, in uh, John chapter 11, verse 49. Caiaphas, let's back up verse 48. They said, if we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. Talking about Jesus. If we leave him alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. And one of them, named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. And thus he spake, not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. And not for that nation only, but that also uh, he should gather together in one the children of God that are scattered abroad. So what Kevin didn't know, he was speaking the truth. He was talking about Jesus needed to die to save not only the nation of Israel, but also all the people of the world who will become obedient to him through the gospel. Hebrews 5 verse 9, he became the author of salvation to all that will obey him. And old Caiaphas didn't know it. But he was speaking, he was speaking, not of himself, but he was prophesying. You know what, I just wonder, I wonder if my neighbors in the Baptist church realize that they're actually telling people the truth. They're stumbled upon it a little bit. Looking for Jesus, well he's not there. Friends, if you're looking for Jesus, you're looking for his own house, you're looking for the house that he purchased with his own blood. You're looking for his church. You're looking for his body. The assembled group of believers that worship God in spirit and truth. John 4, 24. You just drive on past the first Baptist church. He is not there. He's not there. He's actually not in any denomination. Now friends, you may, you may stop and say, well, I'm going to look because this place says that the church of God meets here. Okay. I mean, at least they got they tell you something about the name. Let's see if that's right. But you go inside and they got women preachers. They got a band and a praise team and they're driving their motorcycles up and down the, the aisle like they do over at Mercy Cross. And you say, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. This church of God is not right. This is not the church of God that you read about in the Bible. All right. So I know it's not the right kind. They got the right name, but it's not, it's not, the, it's not the right place. But friends, if it doesn't even say that it belongs to Christ on the sign, you just keep on going. He's not there. He's not there. So when I drive by the First Baptist Church, the United Methodist Church, the Presbyterian Church, the uh, uh, Lutheran Church, when I drive by the Pentecostal Church, I just keep driving. You know why? Because I know that doesn't belong to Christ. That doesn't belong to Christ. He's not there. And so that sign makes me wonder. Have people, do, do they, have they stopped and think that maybe they're telling somebody the truth and they themselves don't realize it? Like old Cephas. Telling people the truth and don't even realize it. Maybe stop and read your signs. Think about what it's really saying. Maybe, maybe perhaps, I'm not saying that's the case, but just say perhaps. Perhaps as a Freudian slip there, I don't know. Maybe God sending you a providential message. Read your own marquee. He's not there. Right, friends, he's not there. He's not there. But he is. He is in the church of the living God, which is the body of Christ. Friends, I'm out of time. I'm out of time. I hope, hope this has helped. You know, just a, a showing some signs that make you wonder. Next time you see a church a marquee outside of a building where people meet and it's got something uh, on it, just wonder a little bit about it. Wonder a little bit about it. If you think it's interesting, send it to me. You can text me, 276-340-2653. Email it to me. Email me a picture. Tell me where it is, whatever. We might use it again. We'll, I've got more. I've got more. We'll do this again from time to time. Till next time, friends, I hope it helps. Thanks for watching. Always make sure you're getting a word from the Lord. Have a good night.